Hey everyone, today we're going to dive into Watch Dogs 14, actually 14.1, and look at the startup experience and what has changed in there. So let's dive in. So I have here an almost empty project. Let's quickly go over it. So this is the catalog API, but there is actually not really something to it. We just have here a query type that has a hello resolver that returns world. Apart from that, there's nothing uh, graph query in it yet. So if we go here to the program CS, we can see that we just have here at graph query, then the catalog catalog types, that is basically all the GraphQL type registration here. And then we have here the simple map GraphQL. Apart from that, we also have set up here the catalog context, which is our DB context. So if we go here to data, you can see there's our catalog context with three entities. And if we go here to the models, you can see the three entities that we have here, brand, product, and product type. So how would I wire that up? Let's start with that first question. Because in Hot Chocolates 13, I had to do a couple of things here to get entity framework or any dependency into my resolver. So if we go here to our query type and let's wipe that out and start just with the brands. So we introduce here a resolver. Let's return a queryable here, a queryable of brand, and then let's just call it get brands. So in Hot Chocolate 13, I would have done either of these things. I could have done here a service attribute and then introduced the catalog context. And then we could have used it and said, this is basically my context. And from that, we want to return the brands. And then this would have worked. But you would have some issue with the concurrency here because we have one pooled context per request scope, essentially. So when the HTTP request is created, ASP.NET Core will create a DI scope. And in this DI scope, we would uh, get this catalog context. And if we have multiple resolvers accessing this context at the same time, we would get an exception. So this is where we had uh, this register DB context in Hot Chocolate 13, but this is now all gone. And actually, we also don't need any service attributes anymore. So we can just get rid of that. And then we can just start this thing. My server is starting, database is being created. And then I'm greeted here by Nitro, our GraphQL IDE. And I can just click here on create document. So I opened here my document tab and I can go to my schema. I can see brands is there. So this worked out. We have a schema with the uh, intended get brands resolver in there. And we can also just expand here our builder and then say we want to create a new query get brands. And then we can get from get brands here the name and run that. And that worked well. But what if we have two of these? running in parallel or three, let's do three. Then in Hot Chocolate 13, this is where you would have to deal with uh, the DB context scoping, uh, which we did with the uh, register DB context extension on the builder, right? But here it just works. And it works because we scope for each resolver, for each async resolver. And because this is interacting with DB context here, uh, with data, with a queryable, it's automatic and async resolver internally. We wrap a middleware around it that is async. And async resolvers by default have a scoped DI around this. So we create a new scope, a resolver scope, for each of these async resolvers. So you don't have to worry about the DB context getting into trouble because of concurrent access. Each DB context is rented out and then used here and then given back to its pool. So in mutations, by the way, this is a bit different because in mutation, we are using the request scope, the original request scope that is given by ASP.NET Core. And we do that because the mutations are guaranteed to be executed uh, serially. So first mutation in a batch, then a second, then a third. And uh, this allows you to use a single DB context to interact on it and then uh, save the changes in a transaction and be done with it. We can also override that here then by using the default query dependency injection scope. So I can define what kind of scope I want to have in queries. So I can pick here, for instance, request that's the original from ASP.NET Core. I can say I want to have and this is the default, by the way. 
that I want to have one scope for each async query resolver. You can also override this on the resolver itself by just saying, I want here the request scope. And if we rerun that here, go back to banana cake pop, execute that again. Then we get here now the error because now we have a request scope, the original one, and we are colliding with access on this DB context. So basically three resolvers at the same time try to access this uh, DB context and we get this well-known exception that we are not allowed to have two operations interacting with the DB context at the same time. The same goes also if you were scoping this differently, like if I sat here in the options, for instance, that I wanna have a request scope. So I wanna reuse the original scope that is passed in. And then I go here to my resolver and say, use resolver scope. And then while every other resolver would now be in the request scope, now this resolver just runs in a resolver scope and then we are fine again. But as I said, we have good defaults uh, that are good for most use cases. So you actually don't need this change here. And then it just works. You don't have to declare any attributes. You just run it, it works. And this also works if we were to use, for instance, a service type here. Let's introduce, for instance, a new folder here, services. And then we introduce here a new brand service. We're gonna inject here the catalog context into our constructor. And then let's have just a simple method down here, which returns a task of brand array, call it get brands async. We pass in a cancellation token here, and then we just do context.brands to array async, pass on the cancellation token. And we are basically done. This is our service. We're gonna register it here as a scoped service. We have to register it as a scoped service or as a transient service because catalog is scoped. Okay, with this registered, we can now here just inject the brand service and we're gonna just return here get brands async. We also need a cancellation token here. So we pass that on. And then this here is now async task. This is an array. We await this here and actually, this is also async, so let's amend the name. And then we are done. So we can restart that. We can run here our thing and it just works. So no error, just the data as we asked for. So this is the first thing that really changed how it works in Hot Chocolate and it makes the startup experience actually so much more simple when you get started with Hot Chocolate. For everyone that used Hot Chocolate 13, it's uh, the first thing you run into and which might block you. But uh, this is basically our thinking process behind that. We wanted to make it really easy to get started with it. And also for people that work a long time already with Hot Chocolate, we wanted to reduce the boilerplate that you have to write with all the register services or register DB context that you had to register on uh, the GraphQL builder. So let's go to the next thing that uh, you run into when you get started with Hot Chocolate. And that is actually, and let me restart the server here, that is actually the introspection. Because by default, we are not doing introspection anymore. The reason for that is that the schema actually is a much richer document and allows us to display much more of the schemas like, like directives on the type system here and so on. So by default, we are doing now a fetch call. And let me go here to the network tab. And there you can see we are doing a fetch call to the SDL endpoint that Hot Chocolate has. Actually, this SDL endpoint exists already in Hot Chocolate 13. And don't worry if you think uh, introspection is gone, it's not. So we can do the introspection. For instance, I can ask here for the schema description, which is null because I didn't define it. But you can do introspection. But by default, we probe for this endpoint here for uh, schema.graphql. And this document has an e-tag we computed once. It has literally no performance impact after that. It's just transferring the data to you. And it's also much smaller than an introspection result. I can recommend also, if you're using tools like Relay, Apollo, just use this schema endpoint to fetch your GraphQL schema from the server. It's much uh, simpler. This also coincides with another change that we did, right? By default, we probe for this. And at development time, you just have both introspection and this endpoint. 
But as soon as we switch to non-development environment, and you can do that actually by uh, figuring out where the launch settings are, which are here. And in the launch settings, you can see that we have a environment variable that tells us that we are in development. So if I put in here prod, it doesn't matter what you put in. If it's not development, then we're gonna detect that and we make your server more secure. So if you run that, then we get an exception and this is because now we switched it to prod and that means uh, that this file here doesn't work anymore. So let me just fix this one. So we quickly copy that over here. So I have a connection string also when I'm not in development. Okay, let me run that again. Then this works. We can go over to our GraphQL IDE then run this query again, and then you see introspection is no longer allowed. So we automatically switch introspection off. Uh, you cannot do introspection on prod, but you still can fetch the schema, right? I can fetch the schema, and this is running over the SDL endpoint. The reason behind that is that with the introspection query, you can actually attack your server by crafting very large introspection requests, by trying to attack recursions in the introspection. We did a lot of work to make that really hard, but switching it off is the easiest way to remove any attack from this part of the graph that is basically put in by the GraphQL server and you didn't build, you didn't had control over. So we take it out automatically automatically by uh, when you deploy to production. And uh, then you can still introspect if you want, just with the schema file. So you're not introspecting, you're using the schema file. You can see I still have that here and I still can do everything with my server. I have IntelliSense and so on turned on. But you also have control over that. So if you wanna have introspection on, uh, also when you're in production, you can opt out of these rules. So I can say disable introspection and say false. And let me add here the argument. So basically I can opt out of the disablement that we are doing by default with hot chocolate now. So with this setting on, we are good to go. We can run our normal query and we can also run here introspection. I can run that, I get the result. So when you get started with hot chocolate, these are the things that you run immediately into. There's another thing, and I did already a YouTube episode on that, is the cost directive, which is also by default on. And we do that because a lot of people, when they get started with GraphQL, they don't know about GraphQL security, how to secure a GraphQL server, how to make sure that your GraphQL server is not overloaded. So we put all these defaults in to make it secure even if you don't have a clue. But then you can opt out of this and this is then your choice. You opt out of a certain security feature and you can opt out in different security features like for instance, persisted queries. But that is kind of documented in the code. So you are opting out here, for instance, of the introspection disablement. I hope this gives you a good starting point to dive into hot chocolate. And uh, there are other episodes following that go into the new paging APIs that you have the new projections engine and many, many more things. So hope to see you soon.